Please join me in welcoming Shadman Mashir to BYU. It's always a pleasure when I'm here. I love uh, BYU. BYU is important for me because that's, this is where I started my professional career uh, many years ago. And um, so thank you very much for inviting me again. Um, Afghanistan, it's interesting. It's complicated. It's fascinating. And it's also depressing in a sense of see what's happening over there. Um, which means that the more we know about the ground realities, the more logic we use in understanding Afghanistan, the better it will be for the future. And then that's the question, whose future? We talk about victory um, from here. We talk about the victory for the Russians, for the Chinese, for the Pakistanis, for the Indians, for the Americans, British, NATO, in Afghanistan. But many times we forget what is victory for the Afghans? So that's something that we, um, I always try to explain that we need to understand what is good for them. And so today, I'll pretend that I'm a five-year-old and I'll pretend that all of you are five-year-olds and we'll try to understand the logic um, of the war, or I call them the wars in Afghanistan, because it's not one war. It's many wars. I'll try to go through that step by step. Let's see if it's the first slide. OK, this is the interesting image. Afghanistan has, throughout history, especially in the last few hundred years, has been looked at something which is for the benefit of its neighbors over here. This is the turn of century uh, cartoon where the British Empire and the Russian Empire were concerned that the Russians believe that the British, if they would penetrate into the empire, they'll go through Afghanistan. And the same was the fear of the British. And that led to the Anglo-Afghan wars, the British being there. Uh, from the British point of view, it was called the great game. Um, Rudyard Kipling coined that word. For the Russians, it was the game of shadows. And it was being played. But the problem is, what about the Afghans? Save me from my friends. So that's where we start to see. Um, if you look at the map of Afghanistan and the region, it is not a very friendly terrain. And that terrain has its plus points and its negative points. When someone asks me to explain Afghanistan in the most simplest of forms, I always use this word. It's like a pond, a water pond. Now, the pond has fish, the pond has minerals, and you can use the pond to go from point A to point B easily. Now, all the neighbors around that pond, their backyards open up to that pond. And since it's the backyards, these are not the areas which are really very well connected to the center of all these neighbors. It's the backyard. Some of the neighbors want this pond. Some of the neighbors need this pond. And this want and need struggle creates chaos within that region. No one trusts each other. And as if the neighbors weren't enough, the US also goes over there. Empires have gone there. It's called the graveyard of the empires. And, and the two words which I always use, why do empires go there? Arrogance and ignorance. And both of them can be a disaster. I mean, since we don't have time today to go through the, um, the history of the wars that were fought in that region, I'm going to try to quickly go through that. So imagine Afghanistan as a pond. But when we imagine that, we ignore what about the stability and benefit of people who are on that pond? Those people s many a times get forgotten. So the war in Afghanistan, OK. But in reality, it is the wars in Afghanistan. So when someone tells me, asks me, what's the victory in Afghanistan? I'm like, OK, victory for which war? 
And they're like, well, there's one war, the war against the terrorists, and then the terrorists will be gone, there'll be democracy, women's rights, people will be happy, everything will be done. No. These are the wars. The, the most basic um, uh, classification I could use is the war with the terrorists, the war within the region, the war within Afghanistan, and the global war. So the first one, the war with the terrorists, that's the war that we hear about. The war on terror, the war against the terrorists, the drone strikes, and all those kind of things. The second one is the war within the region, which means the neighbors. Wants and needs of that bond. So the neighbors have been fighting proxy wars forever, almost forever, through that region. That's the second one. The third one, the war within Afghanistan, which is ethnic as well as religious. Which means for both these conflicts, ethnic, religious, the victory is different because there are so many ethnic groups over there and throughout history they have fought, they have lived together, then fought again. So that war is always in existence. And again, the victory scenario in that war is also different. The fourth one is the global war. Now, how is that the global war? Well, well, the, the, the global war because US, China, Russia, uh, um, um, European Union, all of these guys, all of these groups, and then also the countries which are the have-nots, the smaller countries, they are trying to push each other or squeeze each other in that region, and that's where the global war happens. So it's not just that the forces are there. Every country in the world who has some kind of connection over there is trying to squeeze every other country for victory in that global war. And will that end? Of course, there's no end in sight. Imagine, imagine a new Cold War, but with way more fighting um, sides rather than just two fighting sides generally. So these are the four wars, so it keeps on getting complicated. So when we think about victory, first, what is victory? Two, victory in which war? Then I think about identity. When people ask me, the most misused word is Taliban. Taliban this, the good Taliban, the bad Taliban, the friendly Taliban, the intelligent Taliban, the not so intelligent Taliban, all those kind of things. I'm gonna explain and I'm gonna actually show by images the different classifications. Number one, Afghan Mujahideen. You have to remember that the Afghanistan war did not start in 2001. It started in 1979. So 79, when US decides to aid the, uh, the Mujahideen to push back the Russian interest in Afghanistan and then through Pakistan, through Saudi Arabia, it started in 79. And these guys were called the Afghan Mujahideen. Now, a very important poster, which I saw as a kid. If you notice, this guy has no beard. I mean, I have a beard, but I'm just, I do it to make it look good. I mean, trying to look cool and all that stuff. Uh, it's always difficult with the pointy mustache, and it's always in balance. But anyways, this guy has no beard. And I said, you're like, oh, He's an Islamic fighter. He should have a beard and he should have some kind of a menacing look because I, uh, a couple of months back, I was talking to one, of, one person over there, very, uh, someone who should have known how things were. And then he asked me, where are you from? I was like, I'm from Pakistan. He said, are you Muslim? I said, but you look different. And I was like, I didn't have a beard at that time. I was like, why? Why do I look different? Because in his mind, the idea was a Muslim always have to have a beard and all those kind of things. But anyways, I was like, I'm the different Muslim. So, but this guy has massive hands. Now, Allah Akbar is written over there. You see the sign, the, 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 the Russian sign. These are the, the Russians going in. He's protecting Islam, this guy, without the beard. This was Afghan Mujahideen. If you look closely at these images, I grew up in the 80s. So these guys, if they have beards, it may or may not be purely for Islamic reasons, mostly for tribal reasons. But many of them you see 
are uh, without beards, happy, proud, excited. It was an adventure. It was every, the whole world was on your side. And then we have Charlie Wilson. And if anyone has seen the movie, Charlie Wilson's War, if you uh, read the book, it was adventure and it's uh, this one. So these were considered the good guys. And these gentlemen are the moral equivalents of America's founding fathers. Very, very important, 1985. So we have Charlie Wilson going over there. Um, this is Mujahideen, remember. Rambo also went there. <laughs> so I mean, it's important. So Rambo, and then the movie was dedicated uh, to the brave Mujahideen fighters of Afghanistan. And then they're like, okay, we'll help these guys, we'll train these guys, we'll indoctrinate these guys, and then we'll pack up and go. What happens to these guys? That generation of youngsters who grew up in madrasas in refugee camps and indoctrination was done to them, what will they do? They have a different vision of Islam where you fight the infidel. And at this time, the infidel was the Russians. So Rambo was there. If that wasn't enough, James Bond also went over there. So James Bond also fights. He turns on the turban, I mean, puts on a turban and goes and fights. So everyone was trying to show that these were the good guys. Then. The Russians leave, the Mujahideen groups start fighting with each other, and you have a civil war in Afghanistan. That's the war that I'm talking about, the war within Afghanistan. And that gave birth to Taliban. I call them Taliban 1.0, because it gets so confusing. And 1.0 kind of sounds cool, like 1.0, like who sake of system. <laughs> So, so that then 1.0 can be turned into 1.1, 1.2, 1.29, goes on and on. So 1.0 are the ones which the Emirate started in 1996 and ends in 2001 when US forces and NATO forces go in there. One, how are they different? Black turbans, they were Bundy's school of thought. They were, um, many of them, the average age was young and many of them um, were uh, the victims of the 80s war in Afghanistan. They were either the children of the Mujahideen or connected with the Mujahideen or influenced by the Mujahideen. When three million refugees enter Pakistan, when war takes place, you leave everything, you go. And when you go, how do you survive? Well, madrasas. Now, why is madrasa so important? It's very important. Now, madrasa is considered a very negative institution, a very, uh, uh, um, a place which is bad. I mean, if I'm on the airport, I never tell anyone that I was visiting a madrasa because I'll be the screened separate random person kind of thing. Uh, so anyways, when that happened, these guys had a different vision of the world. They were sick and tired of the uh, civil war in Afghanistan. They come in and they control Afghanistan. And to a certain extent, stability did come in Afghanistan. Of course, I or oh, any average person, any person, I would not, not want to live under their rule. I don't. But if I compare their rule to what was happening during the Civil War, people were far more comparatively, if you remember, comparatively at peace when these guys came into power, comparatively. Of course, the, the women's rights are not there, music is not there, even cricket was banned. All of those things were not there. But if you compare that to the Civil War, which was bloody, which was uh, cruel, which was gruesome. This brought in to a certain level of peace, and then we know about the whole Osama bin Laden thing. But that's not this topic. Now, then we get Taliban 2.0. Now, 2.0, how did that happen? Well, when the US go in and they topple the Taliban 1.0, for the first year, year and a half, things are pretty quiet because the idea was when I would talk to people back home and they'd say, well, you know what, for the first time in the history of that region, a large number of people are actually happy for this invasion because they think that now it's going to be nation building. It's a very small economy. Peace, prosperity, comfort, all those things are going to come in. Mistake. The problem was that the US or the NATO did not go there to build the nation. Yes, they brought in an economy, 
but it wasn't an Afghan economy. It was a war economy. So the war econ economy looks good. Suddenly more money is coming in, more contracts are being given, more companies are getting involved, roads are being built, bases are being built, people are getting jobs, linguists getting jobs. But then the moment that war goes away or the war effort dies down or slows down, the economy is going to crash. So there, so many people made lots and lots of money because of this war economy. But anything happened for the local Afghans? Very less. So Taliban 2.0, come back. Um, the famous quote, I don't know if it's true or not, um, the Americans have all the watches, but we have all the time. So they were there, because imagine, if this is a gun, and I carry this gun, I'm Taliban, and I'm fighting. I drop it, I become a farmer, civilian, shopkeeper, anyone. So it becomes so difficult. So they could wait out, but the US could not because it was costing so much. Around 2003, things start messing up again. And then now you have two kinds of Taliban. There's 2.0, but then there's the, and these, these are the Taliban, the new ones. Now, if you notice, the Mujahideen looked different, dressed differently. When they look at the camera, it's different. The Taliban 1.0 are different, black turbans. These guys, most of their faces get covered. These are the 2.0 criminals. Uh, we have thousands of people dead in Pakistan. We have thousands of people dead in Afghanistan. This is the group. But is it simple? Can we just call them, oh, 2.0 are the bad guys and they're killing? It gets even more complicated. Some of the groups, some of the names that I have listed, I don't even know all these names. And if you look at the dates from till, at one time I uh, was told that in Pakistan, just in Pakistan, there were 60 to 70 different small and large Taliban groups. And they would keep on changing alliance, adding, it was so confusing, who do you go and fight against? So these are some of the groups, and then ISIL, ISIS comes in. Now, 2.0 turns into the Afghan Taliban and the Pakistani Taliban. It makes it more confusing now. So I, which means the Taliban, which are based in the Pakistani tribal areas, are called the Pakistani Taliban. The ones in Afghanistan are called the Afghan Taliban. Generally, the Afghan Taliban would not hit targets within Pakistan. In Pakistan, this, the, the suicide bombings, terrorist attacks, mosques being blown up, schools being attacked, that stuff was being done by the Pakistani Taliban because they said we'll have, again, uh, the, the old uh, black banners and the kingdom of Khorasan, but that's a different topic. So they, they said we're going to establish our own um, uh, Islamic state and all that kind of stuff. Why did Taliban, the Pakistani Taliban get formed? Because when the Taliban were in Al-Qaeda and people from the Central Asian republics and the Arabs who were living in Afghanistan from the 80s, when they were pushed back from Afghanistan, they came into the Pakistani tribal areas. And in Pakistani tribal areas, now there was a confusion. Now, Pakistan tribal areas are there because of a contract. When the British went to wars with the tribes in these parts, they said, you know what, victory is gonna be very difficult. So in simple terms, they said, you know what, we will send our representative, which is called a political agent. The Pakistani tribal area is divided into seven agencies, and each agency has its own political agent. And that political agent is the chief executive, chief judge of that, and chief law administrator, chief executive of that agency. And that political agent is part of the federal government. So this way, the tribes can run their own business, Tribes can be managed through a tribal council, which is headed by the political agent. So th the tribes feel that they have control over their own lands. They do the business, whatever they want to do. But the decisions within the tribal areas are primarily made by the council and the political agent. 
So most of these areas, the level of education, development, all of them are very low compared to the rest of Pakistan. So this is a, a, um, an area on its own, and so US, Pakistani Supreme Court has no jurisdiction in the tribal areas. That's a federal law complication. So again, then who are the good and the bad Taliban? And it keeps on getting confusing, so different versions, and then good and bad Taliban. So good, it all depends on who you ask. What would be good Taliban for the US or for the NATO forces? The ones which do not attack them. They'll be good Taliban. What would be good Taliban for Pakistan? The ones which do not blow up bombs or attack Pakistan targets in Pakistan. They can do whatever they want to do anywhere else as long as they do not um, hurt Pakistan's interest. So they'll be the good Taliban for that. So that's the confusion which means different motives, different objectives. Makes it even more confusing. This is the slide. This was the slide that I was talking about. Um, it gets confusing, and, and it's not a map of Afghanistan. It's, uh, uh, I, I believe this was the slide which was presented to um, journalist Stanley McChrystal, I think in 2010. I may be wrong, but I think that's when it happened. To show that this is the strategy of how we're gonna win Afghanistan. And again, as I mentioned, victory, which war, which group, how, let's not even go there. Let's get confused with this slide. So that's what, I mean, uh, reportedly he had said, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, that if we can understand this slide, we can win the war. So, so this is the slide, so this is the tribal governance, and I have tried, I once promised myself I'm gonna go through this slide from one, and I couldn't, up. I start with the corners, I never reach the middle, and I give up. I did show this to my wife, and my wife thought, you're always watching movies. I'm like, no, I look at this stuff, and then she gets all, she's like, oh, that's hard work. Uh, understanding this, like, okay. okay I, but I do watch movies a lot, and play video games and stuff. So, so anyways, um, neighbors in Afghanistan, around Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, all of them, India and Pakistan, Huge impact. India and Pakistan, that's interesting, because historically, um, Indians always had a close relationship with Afghanistan. Now, that is a problem for Pakistan, because if you look at the map, India and Pakistan are not really very friendly. Uh, so when that's a problem, and they fight a lot, and they argue a lot, and they make fun of each other a lot, um, so an unfriendly Afghanistan is a problem for Pakistan, because this means you are stuck between two unfriendly neighbors. So Pakistan's goal is always to make sure that there is a friendly Afghanistan on its one side. India's goal is to encircle it. And if you put yourself in their shoes, and, and then you can understand the logic behind both these countries, what they're trying to do. You're both trying to influence each other. And that is a proxy war that is being fought. For example, Pakistan had recognized Taliban 1.0, like Saudi Arabia. And the Northern Alliance, which was fighting the Taliban 1.0, it was strongly supported by the Russians and the Indians because the proxy war between India and Pakistan was and is, and maybe for a very long time, will be fought in Afghanistan. Insurgency, if you look at the map, they're mostly Pashtun, and whenever I say Pashtun, I kind of, I get a knot over here because I am Pashtun, so I'm like, okay. And that's why I'm probably the random guy on the airport. Whenever I travel, they always take me to the side because I'm from these areas and stuff. And I, I did make a mistake of carrying a book on terrorism with me, and, uh, and they did, and I put it in the checked luggage, so since I'm a random guy, so they uh, checked my checked luggage and then they found it, and then I was the most interesting person on San Francisco airport for like three, three and a half hours, surrounded by, and all the good cop, bad cop situations. So, so anyways, it was fun, and I played all like, I was acting like James Bond or something. But anyways, uh, so they're like, why do you have this book? I'm like, well, I have it to tell people not to do it. So that kind of thing. So anyways, uh, the Pashtun areas, mostly Taliban insurgency, is associated more with Pashtun, but that's one of the aspects of one of the war 
which is the whole idea of war with the terrorists. Now, when sometimes people ask me that, what if people who have been displaced because of war in Afghanistan are brought back and they start living in their old homes, in their old tribal system, that will solve the problems. Most people who I talk with have solutions like, oh, this is, I know how to solve all the world war problems. I'm like, well, really? So anyways, how do they do that? Time and space plays a very important role. Afghanistan, the tribal customs and usages have played a very important role in keeping that country together, which meant that if I'm living in this valley and the other valley is three days walk from here, something which is customary over here may be blasphemy in the next valley across the mountain. So there were different sets of rules, laws, and customs in different valleys. Some places they were together, and some places they were far. Afghanistan at one time was becoming way more uh, um, civilized in a sense. Um, people were living in larger cities, but with the Mongol invasion in the 12th, 13th century, that disrupted that city living, and people started moving back into places uh, which were difficult to reach in that region. When I, when, I, when I tell people that the war in Afghanistan or the war with the tribes is different than any other war, because in most wars, people fight for the living. In these wars, people fight for the dead, which ancestors. The place you might be living in the most difficult, most remote area of Afghanistan. You have to walk for a week in the mountains to reach your village. Why is that village important for you? Because one very important factor, your ancestors are buried over there. So you have a connection with that land. And so you will do anything to make sure that no one comes in and occupies that village because that is your history, culture, um, faith, everything. So time and space, which means people, millions of people, when they were moved, relocated within Afghanistan and to the neighboring countries and to the West, the customs and usages which they practiced, their value starts going down. They're not practiced the way they are today. If an Afghan was living in Pakistan for the last 20 years, or in Germany, or in the US for the last 20, 25 years, you take that person or that family back and they live in Afghanistan, do you think they'll follow the same customs and usages and then the country stays together? Of course not. Either with time or with space from one place to another, and that is why it makes it way more confusing. Afghanistan, this movement, what I call the movement of the customs within time and within space, started in 79. In Pakistan, it started, in the tribal areas, it started in 2002. So the more time passes by, the more difficult it is for those tribes and those communities to go back, the, what is called the Red Book of Pashto. There's no red book of Pashto, but there's the belief is that I'll, if I'm a Pashtun, I'll treat you with honor and dig dignity that has been written in the red book of Pashto. No book exists, but it's the code. It's called the Pashtun Wali or the tribal code. So will that be impacted? Of course, that's impacted. So that's why if we bring all the people back and everything, it's not going to go back. You know, why do I talk about going back? Victory, peace, victory in Afghanistan. Million dollar question, make it two million dollar question. How do you, you win four different wars being fought at the same time with multiple parties on both sides, multiple sides? It's a network. What is victory? Favorable strategic outcome. It can be in any form. It might not be the death or destruction of the enemy. So. A favorable strategic outcome for all the warring or the entrusted countries and factions is different, which means my favorable strategic outcome if I'm from the US is different than what it is for the Iranian, for Pakistanis, for Indians, all of those people. And that's why there's a clash. So my victory may be your defeat problem. We keep on talking about this and then we miss victory for the Afghans. I, I keep on hearing this thing about uh, victory for 
India, Pakistan, uh, British, uh, Russians, Americans. What about victory for those people who are the ones who are really suffering? And that is a problem. What to be done for them? So I'll stop. I think it's, I'm 35 minutes into the, I went a little bit faster. I just wanted to make sure that, I'm sure you guys have questions, so I went through it. Normally, this is a very long uh, uh, topic. It's like um, explaining Afghanistan to people. It's just like I hope you'll remember the imagine Afghanistan as a pond, and everyone is concerned about their influence or their role or their benefit which they can get from that pond. So, questions? Well, that reminds me of my own class. No one asks any questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, so my name is AK Farooqi. I'm from California, and I'm actually studying Portuguese at the moment. Uh, my question is, you spoke about this concept of victory. Um, do you believe that the retreat from the United States would be the most viable victory for them, and also for the rest of Nigeria and the world after 16 years in the region? OK. Excellent question. Now. If Americans pull back, let's say today, they decide to pull back, everything stops. Afghan government is very weak, very weak. It cannot stand on its own. Does that mean that if Afghan government is toppled, will things get better? Maybe, maybe not. Depends. Is the Afghan government, today's Afghan government, is, is collectively good for the people? Well, it depends. For some people, it's very good. For others, it may not be, because it depends who you ask. For some people, they unfortunately would be more happy under a Taliban rule, because number one thing is safety. Because before we think about women's rights and elections and schools, the first thing is life for yourself and your children. So they might be willing to give up some of those rights in order to have safety, maybe. Now, if the Afghan government is toppled, what happens next? This American goes out. Two sides. One, American pulls back, but they have to stabilize Afghanistan through its neighbors. It's always the neighbors. If the neighbors end up talking, trust building, only then is peace in Afghanistan possible, to a certain level of peace. And Taliban, especially the Afghan Taliban 2.0, the Afghan ones, will have to have some kind of power sharing formula for them to be in the government. They have to give up certain things, and they have to gain certain things, and that's how stability is going to come in, because the fear of an average Afghan, average, the majority of Afghans, is westernization being imposed. That happened in the 30s. The king had to go, because the belief <coughs> was that the king was becoming so westernized he was going to turn Afghanistan into a Western country, and that was a huge, huge, huge problem. And same is the way where the Afghans see them. Today, when you ask an average Afghan, and I speak to many of them, they look at Russians, many of them, I mean, if many of them would not, uh, they look at Russians way more favorably than the Europeans, the, or the Americans, NATO. Despite the fact that NATO might have spent more money in Afghanistan, but the Russians, throughout the last few decades, had done more infrastructure building than the NATO or the US. So when we think, oh, one trillion dollars or 750 billion, today in the morning I was looking at the numbers, 750 billion dollars have been spent in Afghanistan, what did we gain out of it? The important question is, where was this $750 billion spent? Is it on those military operations? F-22 or F-16s, when they fly, that's like $30,000, $25,000, $10,000 per hour flying cost. I think the, the F-35, I believe, uh, till last year, I think it was thirty-four dollars or $30,000 per hour. So all these planes being flown, all these bombs being dropped, all that stuff happening, is that money also counted in that? And two, as I mentioned, it's a war economy. 
which means it's not stable. There's this insecurity, there's this fear that if Americans pull back, not only the government will collapse, but also the economy will collapse. And when the economy collapse, who do you look towards? Someone who can pay you to feed your family. That's what's gonna happen, yes. Okay. Afghanistan, I believe today, I believe it's 147th on the, the richest nations in the world. So it's 147th out of 160 or something. That was the list that I saw. Very low. It could have been much higher had nation build, a tiny bit of nation building if that had happened in post 9-11 in Afghanistan. It didn't happen. Um, Afghans who can leave, who are educated, who can help the economy, if they can leave, they are leaving. There are startups, there are, there, there are a couple of companies which are working on developing um, IT sector in Afghanistan, but most of the people, because there's this level of uncertainty that people say, you know what, I'd rather earn less, but I'd rather be in a safe place. And that, that fear is gonna impact the development of that economy today. You see, I am from that region. When I, when I talk to people over here, I have certain fears and certain concerns when I'm there, which I hope you never have. Because a few years ago, I was at, at a university and there was an international students um, uh, get together. And that was the day when Husni Mubarak was supposed to step down. And there were like five, uh, 10 people spoke and they were all like, wow, Mubarak is gonna go down and it'll be democracy and women's rights and this and all that kind of stuff in, in Egypt. I was the last person, I was like, no, nothing like that is gonna happen. Why? I was like, I'm sorry, I don't want to be always the bad guy in the room. And I, I, the problem is I was like, you have to put yourself in their shoes. These people have not trusted the government ever. If I'm an Afghan, or if I'm in one of those third world countries, I don't, do not rely on strong institutions because the institutions are not strong. So if the institutions are not strong, you cannot have a strong economy because that fear of your neighbor becoming more powerful than you and pushing you back and taking what you earned, that fear always stays. So you keep on trying to be more powerful than your neighbors. It's an unwinnable race. And that gives birth to corruption. And there's massive, massive corruption taking place through um, the government in Afghanistan. I have had a chance to speak with so many people. They're like, wow, we made so much money in Afghanistan working on projects from the US, um, uh, uh, naturalized citizens in the US, when they say, well, there's a women education project. Everyone wants to throw in money at the women education. Fine, good. They go in, the amount of money that these um, academics and development workers and aid workers are making in Afghanistan, it's massive. So I, I don't see, unless and until the neighbors get together and that's where they uh, can support, they'll be, economy can have a little bit of help. And, and, and I don't want to go too long on this answer, but let me explain. Recently I read that there were one trillion dollars worth of uh, minerals in Afghanistan. Well, okay, fine. A mineral is no good if it's underground and I can't reach it. And if I reach it, I have to pull it out and then take it to the market and then decide what is the market value. So just because someone said it's a trillion dollars, it's not a trillion dollars. Right now, it's nothing. So one. Two, um, that famous picture, women in skirts, where I, I don't know whether it's true or not. I hope it's not true. Uh, where we are going back to Afghanistan again because once women wore skirts in Afghanistan and now this means Afghan people once loved uh, westernized societies and all. That is a very, very small, very small percentage of overall Afghanistan population. So if you rely something on which was done by 2% or 3% or 5%, what about the wishes and wills of the remaining 
90, 95%. That's a problem. I hope I was able to answer the question because it gets, keeps on spinning in circles of Afghanistan. Yes. Okay, um, you have to understand that jirga, the word jirga, was an institution which was, was and is very effective in these tribal communities. And what is a jirga? It's a council of elders. It is a dispute, the elders get together, and then they decide, they try to solve the dispute. Are all the decisions of jirga according to the US Bill of Rights? Of course not. I mean, if you cannot apply the, the principles of the US, the first 10 amendments in a jirga because it's very different. Some of the decisions are really, really barbaric. But that is how it has always been established because movement between two points in Afghanistan and most of Afghanistan was very difficult. So you could not go to the city or go to travel by foot or by horse. 20 miles to solve a dispute, you try to solve that dispute within your village. And the village decides what is important for that local community. Now if, and then local community, if they believe that poppy is gonna give them way more money, way more protection against the neighboring clan or group or uh, um, uh, 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 people who they are in the conflict with, they'll go for poppy. So yes, Poppy might be eradicated for how long? Maybe a month, maybe two months. It's going to come back because if there is no strong, independent Afghan economy, people will be required to rely on things like that, unfortunately. So, I mean, I hope your dad is safe and all that stuff over there, but it's not going to work. I'm sorry for that answer. I always apologize for this answer. I'm like, I wish I could one day say, well, There'll be flowers and roses falling from the sky. I wish I could say that one day. But I'm always looking at the depressing stuff. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm from Colorado. I'm a freshman up here. Um, what institutions has the United States turned back? Not so much like from a military standpoint, from an economic political standpoint. Are there very many institutions in that hemisphere of the world that we've tried to you know, support for and try to create some stability? You obviously have mentioned that you know, they don't necessarily like institutions, but you know, have they ever tried to just go to a very factionalized system and kind of like, you know, they're the, the, the tribes and they're, they're trying to take back the tribes instead of backing whole institutions for the whole region? Or what have we kind of done there? Okay, now, I, I didn't say they don't like institutions. What I meant was that it's the customs and usages because institutions, because of the geography, it wasn't possible to rely on strong central government or strong state government with strong institutions. Other than that was the problem. That's why they relied on local system. That's what the British did. They created these agencies, the tribal agencies, and that is an institution, which means one person, it's totally against the principles of the US Constitution where one person is the judge, the chief executive, the chief judge, and, and then the, um, uh, um, what do you call it, the judge, executive, and the legislature, so they can make their own laws. Now, that model had worked in the tribal areas in Pakistan. Now, how do they enforce the orders of this political agent or the council? Well, the way to imagine for a second, this is that tribal agency, this room, and I'm the political agent, and all of you are heads of tribes with living within this agency. Some of you have thousand people, some of you have 50,000 people, 100,000 people as part of your tribe. So s bigger tribes and smaller tribes. We get together and we solve disputes. We run this agency together where I have more authority, but I do it through the council. All of you, based on your population, have to provide um, men who can be part of the paramilitary force. 
and that paramilitary force is going to administer the law, impose law and order within this agency. So which means local policing, so which, which means like your tribe has 50,000 people, you give in 200 men. Your tribe has 10,000 people, you bring in 50 men or something like that. This means that paramilitary force is composed of people from that tribe, those tribes, not foreigners. And who is on top of that paramilitary force? The regular military officers. So Pakistan military officers, when they are posted to the tribal areas, their uniform changes and they become the officers over those tribes. And the soldiers are from those tribes. Recently, this idea was also popping up. What if instead of having an Afghan National Army, you keep the Afghan National Army for the defense of Afghanistan and have local tribal uh, paramilitary forces which can capture the grid mentality, which can capture certain areas and make sure that peace and stability stays over there. The problem is massive, massive corruption violence, cruelty, lots of things. I mean, you just have to Google this information, you'll come across so much stuff that people are too scared to trust an organized force like that so that they can impose their rule. And it is different. In, in Pakistani tribal areas, it was, and it still is, way different than the way it is in Afghanistan because people, as far as they can remember, they have seen violence and they have seen violence through the hands of people who had authority. So the trust is not there anymore. It will be very difficult. Yeah. So, the, so the United States, to clarify, hasn't ever like tried to back a specific agency or specific or even sort of mafia that, that tribal system is really you, you, you know, Afghanistan, ha uh, the U.S. has tried to build the Afghan National Army, and which has turned into a disaster. Uh, it turned uh, sort of Afghan National uh, Police Force and stuff. Again, it's a huge disaster. There's a reason why the Afghan government has such limited control over Afghanistan itself. Large chunks, I mean, the estimates can be from 40% to 10% to 60% depends. Uh, those areas are within the control, effective control of the Taliban 2.0. So if that institution, institution, institutionalization, I'm sorry, had stuttering, had been successful, things would have worked out. It didn't work out. Because again, as I told you, so I'm from that region that distrust, that insecurity that I have from my neighbor, I'm not going to rely my neighbor with the gun and authority bef because before you know it, he'll become so powerful, I'll have no defense against him. Yeah, I won't say her because it's always him in that situation. When Al-Qaeda and the foreign fighters moved into Pakistan tribal areas when they were flushed out from Afghanistan, what did they do? In Pakistan, there was a balance which meant that local population, their tribal chiefs represented them. And their tribal chiefs could take their grievances to the political agent. So more than a thousand tribal chiefs were killed. So this hierarchy, one step was gone. So when the tribal chiefs were killed, people within these agencies were left on their own. And that's when Taliban, the Pakistani Taliban, Al-Qaeda and all those kind of things step in which means they turned the religious leader and the criminal, combined them into one, and before you know it, you had men running around with face masks and guns who were nobodies deciding who lives and who dies. So that fear is there. I mean, um, if you guys know about that um, Malala Yousafzai, the girl who was shot. That city where she was from, Swat, for years, it was under the control of the Pakistani Taliban, and then she gets shot and all those things. Once those um, insurgents, those miscreants were flushed out, a university was being built over there. And the idea was to name it an Islamic university. But the people over there had reached such, they were so sick and tired of, because again, they, they thought, oh, Islamic university, this means again, it's gonna be that militancy is gonna come in and stuff like that. People who go to mosques five times a day, all religious, but they were not comfortable with the university being named an Islamic university because they had seen such a negative portrayal of Islam uh, that they were governed by for so many years. Where uh, Swat being the 
the, the, the capital of the tourism industry in Pakistan, the Switzerland of Pakistan, many people have, uh, uh, who have met at BYU have actually traveled to Swat and gone through Swat. Uh, within three years from the tourism hub, it turns into a place where dead bodies are hanging from uh, lampposts and um, lying around on the street as a symbol of authority of these um, Taliban, the Pakistani Taliban. So you always have to, when someone says Taliban, you always have to figure out which Taliban he or she is talking about. Only then will you know what are the motives of these people. Yes, sir. Um, final question. Final question, okay. Okay, excellent question. Now, it's not just ISI, or it's not just Pakistan. It's the RAW from India. It's the other agency. It's the, the, uh, the agencies from all the other neighboring countries. As I mentioned, how do you influence Afghanistan? You do not go and carry the flag. You always do it through intelligence networks. So ISI and RAW are actually fighting that war in Afghanistan. So it's, but, but many times on the media, in the news, I only keep on seeing the, the name of ISI, that ISI seems to be some kind of a renegade agency. Of course it's not. Uh, people uh, go into ISI, which means they're regular military officers, for three, four years they spend in ISI, then they move back. So it's not a renegade agency, it's part of the military, and it is uh, there to protect Pakistan's interests the way Ra in India is there to protect the Indian interests in the neighboring areas. So I would agree more with this idea of everyone is doing it. So, but it's just, and, I, and, and I'm not saying it because I'm from Pakistan, because I, since I grew up over there, I, I've seen that whole system. When I look at the media and anything happens in other parts, they're like, oh, ISA is the one doing, dealing with this and stuff. But uh, everyone is doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.